uh, my name is Sienna Fournier. I'm the executive director of the Histiocytosis Association. And um, as you know, the association, we're dedicated to raising awareness for histiocytic disorders, providing education and emotional support, and funding research leading to better treatments and a cure. And we're really thrilled today to be able to partner with Got Transition. They aim to help youth and adults, move, young adults, move from pediatric to adult health care. And they have some phenomenal resources that I know many members of the community have leaned on. So we're really grateful for them uh, spending time with us today to share more about their family toolkit and other resources that are available for you. So I'd love to introduce your speakers today. Um, here with us, we have Annie Schmidt, Research and Policy Associate with Got Transition and the National Alliance to Advance uh, Adolescent Health. And um, she, Annie conducts research and policy analysis and published several peer review articles and reports, including a systematic review of healthcare transition intervention outcomes, a guide for designing a value-based payment initiative for healthcare transition, a report on Medicaid managed care contract language, and tip sheets on transition coding and payment. She recently worked with Got Transition's Family Advisory Group to create a family toolkit with resources to use throughout the process. And I'm excited for Annie to share more about that with you today. We also have joining us Erin Say, and Erin is a Transition to Adult Life Coordinator at SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. And um, this is New Jersey's federally funded Parent Training and Information Center which is dedicated to serving children and families with the greatest need of, due to disability or special health care needs, including mental health, poverty, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, language, immigrant or homeless status, and these involved in children welfare or juvenile justice. Ms. Sai also works with a diverse group of stakeholders, including students, young adults, families, professionals, to improve outcomes for youth in education, health care, and independent living. And she had the honor of serving on many councils and boards, including the New Jersey State Independent Living Council, and Got Transitions Advisory Board. So I'm thrilled to bring both speakers for you today to talk more about Got Transitions Resources and Family Toolkit. We also have with us today a very special guest, Darcy, who is an advocate and mother to longtime LCH warrior Nick. Darcy has been a very active member of the Hisio community and has brought to um, the association's attention the challenge of the transition of care from pediatric to adult. And so um, rather than um, share Darcy's story, I'd love for Darcy to be able to share her story with you. And so I'm going to pass the mic over to Darcy. And and um, thank you so much for taking some time to share your experience with the transition. Hey, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all who are attending. Uh, I'm thrilled that the association has brought together this webinar for this fantastic topic. Um, I feel like if we can share some information today and learn from each other so that we feel better equipped to go forward, that'll be a great thing. So I'll share a little bit of information about our Histio story and also some of our uh, thoughts and experience on the topic of transitioning from pediatric to adult care. So our family's Histio story starts 18 years ago when um, my husband and I had our first child, Nick. Uh, upon birth, it was apparent that there was a problem. Uh, something wasn't quite right with, with Nick. He uh, had good vitals and such, but he was born, as they, they described it, um, almost entirely red. So about 85% of his skin was severely disrupted, um, almost open, so to speak, and uh, just the protective layers weren't there. So he couldn't control temperature and hydration, and he just wasn't as robust as a, a newborn baby should be. So he was in the NICU. And they had no idea, of course, what was wrong. And I, as a first-time parent, was freaking out and terrified. Um, so we got his Langerhans cell histiocytosis diagnosis when he was five weeks old after a skin biopsy. So for us, I know some people have a super long journey to getting a diagnosis. For us, it was about five weeks. So at that point, at least we had a name for what was going on. Um, 18 years ago, what they did for staging and what they were looking for was a little bit different than, than what they look for today. Thankfully, we've advanced in some ways. So to the best of their ability, they, they staged him the best they could and couldn't find any, um, any evidence that it was anywhere else other than the skin, although he did have a few health problems. So I think it's, we're always a little suspicious of what exactly his, his initial state was. So he was on uh, chemotherapy as an infant. I think we started when he was about four months old, and we got him to a state of visibly no active disease on the skin. But when we stopped treatment after about six months, um, it came back in about three weeks. You know, we went three weeks without treatment and there it was back on the skin again. 
So that was the start of what I call our uneasy friendship with this disease, sort of living with it, coasting until we could coast no more. Uh, he ended up getting chemotherapy as a preschooler. And then also um, for pretty much the bulk of middle school, he was on chemotherapies. He today still has active disease visible on the skin, but he and we have elected not to treat it. And that is, of course, with the input of uh, some of the histio experts around the country. He is a very unusual case, unusual in a lot of ways. I guess we, we all have unusual uh, situations and, and he's no exception. Uh, so that's kind of the, the histio story uh, in a nutshell, like 18 years condensed into a couple of minutes. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So um, thinking about, well, this whole journey with histio has been depicted as the picture on the right. And when I think about uh, transitioning from pediatric to adult care, I, I love this picture. It really sort of symbolizes for me the way the path looks. Like I, I can, there's this happy inviting sun in the distance peeking through the the mountains and there's this crazy windy scary dangerous looking road um you know on the way to that sun and uh, we are somewhere on that road at this point uh, we we haven't reached that sunny point yet but we're working on it and i have a lot of hope that um that we'll get there and yeah speaking of hope i think um when i think about transitioning Nick to adult care and just really adulthood in general. Um, I, I have a lot of hope. I'm very hopeful. I think some of my, my hopes for Nick are that we will open up his world and give him the control that he wants and needs, but still offering the support that he wants from, from us as his parents. Um, I really am excited for him to live as independently as possible and to be confident in his healthcare team. So those, I mean, are a lot of the, the positives that I see in this journey. Um, I also have a lot of feelings, <laughs> you can see them there on the left, some days very needy, frustrated, angry, overwhelmed, confused, clueless, all of that, scared. Um, it's, it's scary, um, but it, it's, a, it's a journey. Additionally, I, I wanna stress that I feel very privileged that we can do this with him. Um, I, I know some histio families, and you probably do too, where their children didn't, didn't make it, and they don't have this, um, the luxury of helping to usher the child into adulthood. So while I have struggles and I can complain about them sometimes, I also feel very privileged and grateful. And those, all of those feelings can sit together in the same space, um, and, and that's a lesson I've, I've really learned over time. Um, yeah, so that, that's the picture. Those are the words, the things that I think about. Uh, if you wanna to proceed to the next slide, please. In terms of some tangibles, I told my family that I was doing this presentation today and I asked Nick, um, and by the way, he's a senior in high school. So, you know, he, he's still living with us and, and we're very involved in his life. But I asked him, you know, if he had tips for um, older teens or young adults about medical appointments. Uh, and, and these are some of the things he came up with. Don't be distracted by your phone. So we've been working hard on that one. Ask questions if you don't understand. And, and one of the things Nick and I have been doing for a few years now is before appointments, kind of strategizing. Like, what is, what is the reason for this appointment? What do we want to get out of this appointment? What questions do we have going into it? We write those things down. Um, and, so, and then we talk about, like, which parts do you want to do? Which parts do, do you want mom to do? And so we kind of work it out that way. He also suggests that you um, advocate for yourself, that you use your parents' help, which sometimes he doesn't want our help, but sometimes he does. And then finally, uh, his last tip was to pay attention, even if you don't think it has anything to do with you, because it probably does, which I really like that one. <laughs> uh, so those were Nick's tips. So uh, I told my husband I was uh, giving this presentation and uh, he had one tip for parents and caregivers about medical appointments. His tip is to work hard to shut up and let your kid guide the discussion, only adding info if necessary. So, and that is a good tip and I, I try to use that one too. I have to bite my tongue sometimes. Uh, in terms of uh, things that I was thinking about, I mean, I'm, I'm reflecting back on some of the things we have done over time. You know, I've been thinking about transition for a long time. I mean, I've been going to histiocytosis association events for, well, 18 years. 
um, one of my first events was in Chicago and I see one attendee on the line and I said hi to you in the chat. I met you in Chicago. You sat behind me. I had a three month old baby. Um, your child was, was, I think on transplant too. I remember that very well. Um, the things I have come to understand throughout the years is that obtaining good pediatric care for people with histio is difficult. Obtaining good care as you're an adult is much more difficult. So I've had that in the back of my mind. I've sort of dreaded, right, coming to this point, but here we are. So I've been working with Nick for a long time. Um, so my number one tip is to start slowly and start early. Um, I did things with Nick at early teen years, you know, an, an easy ad is, okay, Nick, you check in at the desk when we're here for the appointment. So he starts to do some of the talking and I help him with questions, that type of thing. So these are there's some really small ways that we can get our kids more involved. Uh, maybe he can be responsible for asking one of the questions or that type of thing. Uh, another tip I have is to uh, model inclusion and collaboration uh, when you're like with your child, uh, working with doctors at appointments um, to encourage direct interaction with your child. And some of the ways I do this are um, to direct the conversation, like pull, pull Nick into the conversation. So if the doctor is talking to me about stuff, I might, you know, offer my viewpoint and then say, Nick, what do you think about that? Or, you know, kind of volley it back to him. Another thing I had trouble, and I've had this with numerous doctors, but one in particular, as soon as he was done typing in the electronic medical record system would just totally focus on me and we'd have a very intense conversation and I needed to get him to start talking to Nick more. So my little trick, and you can do experiments with your doctors, is you move slowly across the room as the doctor's talking to you and position yourself right next to your child or if, if they're on a table, you know, sitting on a table or right behind them if they're in like an exam chair, something like that, so that you're actually physically really close to your kid. And then the doctor is all of a sudden looking at both of you. So it really draws their attention to your child and, and hopefully helps to facilitate more direct interaction between the two of them. So I like to have some fun and see how long they'll follow me with their eyes. Um, additionally, kind of along the same lines, but uh, post-op once, it did not go well. This was just last year, actually. And the doctor was going to leave me to explain the results to my child once he was out of uh, uh, post-anesthesia. I said, no, 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 no. I mean, he was 17 and a half. You need to explain this. We're going to explain it together. And then when we got into the room, I moved a chair right to bedside. And I said to the doctor, here's here's a chair for you, because I wanted to get him lower on the same level with Nick, not towering over him. So again, just trying to get a connection between the provider and, and my child. Um, my tip number three, find and use resources. I found the GOT transition site. Uh, I don't even know how I first stumbled upon it, um, but I have used those materials for a few years now, and it is absolutely packed full of stuff. I can't wait for you to hear from Aaron and Annie on that. Um, our state offers some resources that were helpful, so you might have to just, well, like you've been doing for years with Histio, poke around and find things, um, your school district, that type of thing. Um, so find these resources and definitely leverage them. Fourth, just to have high expectations. Um, we have to try it. We don't know if it's going to work if we don't try. Uh, one thing I did with uh, Nick and his younger brother was I enrolled them and myself in a first aid and CPR class. So he has a little bit of basic education about like what constitutes a medical emergency? What are some things I can do? So just kind of training him in understanding healthcare. Um, and then finally, keep trying and learning. Uh, be kind with yourself as you figure out what path is best for your family. And we are still figuring that out. It's probably a never ending thing. Um, so those are my practical tips. I have one last thing if you wanna move to the next slide, please. So this is um, just a screenshot of the top part of a tool on the Got Transition website that our family just absolutely loved. This is a transition readiness assessment for youth. So you give this to your child and have them fill it out. And it is a fantastic way to generate conversation um, about, you know, are, are you doing this yet? Do you want to do it? You know, and you can have a conversation and figure out these are the things that we actually need to work on. Pick off one or two things and start sort of knocking them off the list. Um, so I have absolutely loved this assessment. And I'm super excited for Annie and Aaron to show you all of the other cool things on the Got Transition website. So that uh, concludes my information. Thank you so much for um, your time. And I'm going to turn it over to Annie and Aaron. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna give a little bit of background information about transition and then share a resource um, that we have that's available for families that has a lot of um, family resources about transitioning to adult care. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna ask Erin a few questions um, so she can share her own experience with the transition process. Um, first, this work was funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. So now just for some background information, these are two overarching goals of healthcare transition. So the first is to improve the ability of youth and young adults to manage their own healthcare and effectively use health services. And the second is to ensure and organize clinical process is in place in both pediatric and adult practices to facilitate the healthcare transition preparation, transfer of care, and integration into adult care. And this is the process that's recommended by professional organizations, um, and it's called the six core elements of healthcare transition. So there is evidence that shows that when a structured healthcare transition process is in place, the youth and young adult can show improvements in health, um, such as adherence to care or improved quality of life. It can also improve patient experience, such as satisfaction or decreased barriers to care. And it can also improve utilization of care, such as decreases in hospitalizations, shorter length of stay, and an increase in visits on the adult side. So these three professional organizations, it's the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, and American College of Physicians, they um, in 2018 released a clinical report where they recommend that all youth with and without special health care needs receive the structured healthcare transition process that's called the six core elements of healthcare transition. Um, and this is a process that begins early in adolescence, around age 12, um, and continues into young adulthood around age 25 or so. Um, this process involves the transition preparation, which happens on the pediatric side, and then the actual transfer or the move from pediatric to adult care, and then the integration into adult healthcare. So now I'm gonna show a video um, that just is another way to share some background information about what transition is. For many young adults, transitioning to adulthood can mean going to college, finding a job, or moving out on your own. This can be exciting, but also really challenging. One transition that you may not have thought about is healthcare transition, or HCT, which means moving to an adult model of care where you are the main person in charge of your health. HCT is not a single event. It's a process that can take several years. Learning about your own medical history is the first important step. So ask your doctor how to access your health information. A major part of HCT is learning to manage your own health and health care. To start, you can make your own doctor's appointments, fill your own prescriptions, and talk with your doctor alone. After you turn 18, your doctor can only legally talk to you about your health. Your health information and medical records will be kept confidential. It is up to you to make your own health choices. You can decide, for example, if you want your parents to see your records or be in the doctor's appointment with you. For those who see a pediatrician, HCT also means moving from your pediatrician to an adult doctor. This usually happens between the ages of 18 and 22. Some people see a family physician or a doctor who sees patients throughout their life. If you see a family physician, you'll need to change who makes your health decisions, but not your doctor. In an adult model of care, you and not your parents or caregivers are in charge of making decisions about your own health. To plan for this transition, talk to your doctor and ask them about their policies. If you see a pediatrician, ask them when you need to leave their practice. You can also ask them to help you find a new adult doctor to move to. HCT is all about independence and empowerment, so be proactive. 
Find an adult doctor who is accepting young adults into their practice and takes your insurance. And don't forget to encourage your friends to be proactive about their healthcare transition too. For tips and resources to make your healthcare transition as smooth as possible, go to gottransition.org. Okay, so that video, um, it's available on our website. It's in both English and Spanish. Um, there are links to it at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about another resource that we have. That's our Family Healthcare Transition Toolkit. And this is what we created with our family advisory group um, that Erin was a part of. And just the other organizations um, that were represented on the group are listed here on this slide. And so the toolkit includes 10 resources to help youth and their parents or caregivers throughout the transition process. Um, and now I'm gonna go through some questions and ask them to Erin so she can share um, about her own experience. And then I'll summarize the relevant tools in the family toolkit. So the first question is when should my child and I start to think and talk about transition. And I apologize to everybody. I had to visit the doctor. I got a little laryngitis, but I'll be okay. So bear with me. Um, so I wanna chime in also and agree uh, with what Darcy had said. You know, uh, the AAP clinical report states age 12 and um, for healthcare transition. But, you know, in my humble opinion, the sooner the better. Um, teaching our children to self-advocate and use their own voice to talk about their own body, I think is an important step um, in terms of, you know, uh, just growing up for everyone, you know, again, and, and teaching them to have some sovereignty. Um, I think that you should begin to think about it as soon as you believe your child is developmentally um, ready to tell the doctors how they're feeling and we can start building from there. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to summarize a tool that's in the Family Toolkit. We have a couple of transition timelines, and one is for the youth and young adult, one is for the parent or caregiver, and it has some helpful steps that they can take at different stages of the transition process, which starts early around age 12 and then continues into young adulthood around age 25. So I'm just gonna share a few examples that come from the parent version. Um, so early on in adolescence, around age 12 to 13, the parent or caregiver can encourage their teen to ask their doctor questions about their own health. Um, so this is a way to try to engage them in their appointment. And then around age 14 to 15, the parent or caregiver can help their teen practice making the doctor's appointment and ordering prescription refills. So these are some skills that they can start to develop in adolescence. And then around ages 16 to 17, the youth or youth parent and care caregiver can work with their doctor to make and share a medical summary. And this medical summary um, should eventually be shared with the adult provider um, when they make that transfer to adult care. And then around ages 18 to 21, the parent or caregiver can encourage their young adult to ask their current doctor to help find a new adult doctor um, while making sure that the new doctor accepts the young adult's health insurance and helping them to learn if there will be any charges at a visit with the adult provider. And then lastly, in young adulthood, the parent or caregiver can encourage their young adults to actually get care from their adult doctor to attend the appointments, continue learning how to manage their own health and healthcare, and update the medical summary um, that ideally was shared by the pediatric provider with the adult provider. And now I have another question for Erin, and it is what are the recommended healthcare transition services? Well, Annie, um, I'm wondering if you could go back to the slide with the timeline mm -hmm. uh, just for a minute. Um, so I just want you guys to think about this. You know, these are the recommended timelines. The ages are not set in stone. Again, we're going back to thinking about 
your own child's developmental uh, personality, et cetera. Um, you want to keep in mind their individual medical needs as well. Um, we now have many tools, and this is what I want you guys to think about in terms of natural supports to reach these types of goals. Um, you know, again, in addition to the toolkit and some of the things that you're going to see about the teen assessments, that type of thing, I got transition. You know, a lot of our natural supports are now just technology via your phone, your computer. There's an app for that. There's an app for everything. And, um, you know, even things like when we talk about scheduling appointments or taking your medication, those are things you can use a Google calendar, have alarms, notifications, alerts. Um, you know, we're always on our kids about, you know, they're on their phone, they're looking at it. So why not utilize these tools that are already there to try to achieve some of these goals that are mentioned on the timeline? Um, also, doctors have websites or health portals. When we talk about the medical summaries, almost all doctors, whether it's a specialist or physician, has the visit summary somewhere on that portal. Again, you know, our kids know technology better than we do. These are natural supports for them and it can make it easier um, for them to, again, um, achieve some of these steps for healthcare transition. Um, and again, some also, like if you're on with a specialist, I think um, when your kids are young, one of the things we talk about is, um, you know, when do I tell my child about their disability? Especially a lot of the kids with developmental disabilities, um, people don't want to, you know, say, when do I tell my child they have autism or Down syndrome? What is that? Sometimes you'll see when the teenagers are older and developmentally ready, some of their specialists might even have LinkedIn resources on those health um, healthcare summaries. Okay, next, Annie. Great, thanks. So this next question then is, what are the recommended services? Okay, um, so... The God Transition website, and I want to tell you, if you're not familiar with this, it is gold. It is gold for you. It is gold for your doctors. It is gold for your kids. Um, so the first thing that you're going to see is, um, well, I want to preface something first. This was the outcome of many, many years and many, many people um, striving uh, to improve on the six core outcomes from maternal child health. The one was the transition. For many, many years, transition to adult, um, you know, healthcare was the lowest outcome of all the measures. For those of you that have children, um, you know, with complex medical needs, you know how hard it is to get adult providers. And again, that's one of the barriers that I think has contributed. One of the big parts that was helping um, doctors, and when you go on the website, you're gonna see you know, the AAP clinical report, it was sort of a guideline. It has algorithms, tools for doctors, timelines. Many of the medical practices, I worked on medical home pro uh, projects for a long time. They really didn't, they wanted to do it. They didn't know how to go about it. There was no real guidance until this clinical report, which has been revised now. So they continue to look at it and update it. Um, when you go on the GOT Transition website, the first thing you're going to see those different categories for parents, um, youth and clinicians. Again, you're going to see uh, updates. There's a new, a lot of people say, well, my kid can't help, you know, transition. They also have an intellectual or developmental disability. There's a new project and there's going to be a national repository for resources for those youth as well. Healthcare transition is for everybody. There are tools out there to serve everybody. Um, so you'll see that under the updates, but you're going to also then see um, where you see the, under that update, uh, opportunities for medical practices to get training via um, GOT transition and some of the resources. And that's where you'll find that AAP clinical report. Do not assume your doctor has read it. When you start asking those questions, and again, you know, even if you send it through your portal, might be a nice way, um, you know, to just say, oh, I saw there's guidelines in the AAP clinical report send them an email. Um, again, this is a really great way to start to engage your, um, you know, providers in healthcare transition, but also to back you up. You know, if they're saying, oh, I don't think he's ready. Well, again, you can go back to the algorithms and timelines on the AAP clinical report. Next. 
So the next question we have is what questions can my child and I ask our doctor about transitioning to adult care? Now, I had a lot to say about this, but I don't think I need to because Darcy, I should have had her present the slide. She did um, you know, such a great job of some of the things that are in my notes. And um, you know, the first thing is when does my kid room room alone? That's a big question. I go back to when you're comfortable, when they're developmentally ready, when, um, you know, you're the expert of your child, uh, you know, don't let these timelines feel like you're forced to. But I do think it's important, again, that we encourage that type of independence. I think that, um, you know, when Darcy had said some of her initial steps, they were similar to my journey. And that's why I'm not going to belabor it too much on what I did. But the appointments sign in, you know, your kid knows how to sign his name. That's a first step. Um, you know, eventually what I would do is I would be in, in the beginning, if it was routine. I would be proactive. I would tell my youth, you know, what, um, what we were there for. If my child was ill, then maybe they're not ready to sit there. Maybe they're not able to tell the doctor how they're feeling, but the point is you want to get them started. You want to have, you know, a little bit of a piece of the action. I want to go back to what Darcy said that's important. Be there in the beginning to get your physician to, because remember, healthcare transition is going to be a process of handing it over where your youth is the leader and make sure the doctor is asking their questions. Or if they ask the doctors looking at you, you look at your child, repeat the question and tell, you know, direct them to answer the doctors. Sometimes some of our doctors have a hard time in this process as well, especially with our children with complex needs. I started leaving the examining room when it was appropriate, when my youth were um, comfortable. And again, I walked out. Some of those other questions we talk about. Next slide. I think it's really important that you guys know that you may have to be the one to generate this conversation. And um, again, don't be afraid to. And uh, even if your child is past 12, then start next visit. Great, thank you. So there are a couple of resources in the family toolkit that just have some sample questions that the youth or young adult can ask or the parent or caregiver can ask their doctor um, about healthcare transition. And I'm just gonna show a few examples that come from the tip sheets. Um, so the first question is a question that the parent or caregiver can ask during the child's adolescent years, um, such as what age does my child need to change to a new adult doctor? Um, and this does, it can differ um, for individual by individual, but a practice might have a policy about what age um, they tend to transfer their patients. Um, so it's a good question to ask them to understand that. And then there are some questions to ask um, closer to the time of transfer, such as, do you have suggestions of adult doctors for my child to transfer to? So the pediatrician um, might be able to help just identify an adult provider and provide a referral um, if they're aware of um, providers who are accepting new patients. And then there are on the youth young adult tip sheet, there's some questions to ask during the adolescent years, such as when do I start to meet with you on my own? So this is what Erin was just talking about. Um, meet with you on my own for part of the visit to become more independent. Um, so in that clinical report, um, the professional organizations do recommend that um, at some point during the transition process, ideally early on in adolescence, um, the youth gets to have some time alone um, just to begin learning to um, advocate for themselves, ask their own questions and talk to the doctor on their own. And then there are some questions that they can ask the new adult doctor before they actually schedule the appointment. Like, do you take my insurance? Do you require any payment at the time of the visit? And then there are some questions to ask the adult doctor um, closer to the time of the actual appointment, such as, did you receive my medical summary from my pediatric doctor? When Annie talked about discussing insurance and the age, 
as you know, transitioning, especially to specialists, could be really difficult. Some doctors will be like 18. Surprise, we've had some doctors actually who have sent families birthday cards with a little note. Happy birthday, you're 18. You know, it's now time for you to look in your insurance website and find another neurologist. Not a good thing. I experienced that myself with my own son's neurologist. And it was at a time when I was in crisis. I hadn't seen him for about nine months. I was in a crisis and I learned my healthcare transition dilemma was uh, his uh, receptionist called me back and I was like, thank you, thank you. It was five o'clock. I thought, oh, I missed you. And she said, oh, I'm sorry. You're not going to be so happy because he's not taking patients after they're 18. You know, your son turned 18. I think another thing too, for many um, uh, in terms of the insurance, you have to make sure what they take because for many youth, if they're now eligible or applying for social security, they may, you may choose now to have them under a uh, Medicare or I mean, Medicaid or Medicare, they might be eligible if they're social security eligible. And you might find out that your specialist doesn't take that. So I just really wanted to reiterate, reiterate the importance of that. Also, I think for the insurance for all of you, because we didn't cover this in the slides, check with your state. Every state has, you know, the Affordable Care Act mandated that, um, you know, youth can stay on up till 26 under certain eligibility criteria. But also your state may supersede the Affordable Care Act. Uh, for example, in my state, uh, if your child has a disability, you can keep them under your coverage up to age 30. And now I have another question for Erin is how does my child's or how does my role and my child's role change throughout the transition process? So the goal is to gradually for the youth to become the leader. And you're going to go from parent led. I mean, again, as this, you know, clearly um, depicts, you know, initially you're responsible for everything. You know, the role of the youth is that they receive the care. You know, the gradual steps of healthcare transition is that eventually they become the leader and manager of their own health care. I think it's really important that, again, even if you anticipate, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in, in the upcoming slides about reaching age and majority. If you anticipate that your youth maybe have a complex medical need, intellectual or developmental disability are gonna need support, they should still be part of these healthcare transition steps. And um, remember, give them the opportunity because um, you know there's dignity and risk. And I, 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 as a mother, a very protective mother, that's something I had to really remind myself all the time. You have to give them the opportunity, dignity and risk, even if it doesn't work out, they'll learn from the experience. Great. So the next question is, how can I learn if my child needs help with decision making? So again, to kind of go back on this, and I'm not trying to single out um, youth that have maybe a, a comorbidity of a healthcare need and intellectual or developmental disability, but there's always this general assumption that if they do that, they're never going to be able to do this. You know, there's a, a lot of talk lately, and I'm really glad it's been in the news uh, with Britney Spears and guardianship and all that. Um, some people, their doctors or school might act as though that is a mandatory thing you have to do because, you know, your child at 18 can suddenly not make all their decisions. Well, I want you guys to think about this. At 18, how much support did you need? How much did you get? probably, you know, it, a lot in some areas and maybe very little in others. Um, I was, we did a symposium at Rutgers Law and I remember a judge, it was all lawyers there. He asked them, honestly, were you taking care of all your healthcare decisions? And, you know, even like your basic needs at 18. And again, these were all very bright, either already lawyers or law students. And, you know, most of them were not. So I, I want you guys to remember that you know, supported decision making for healthcare transition. It's not a race, it's a journey. Your youth may, um, you know, travel at different paces. And what they might need when they are, say, 18 or 21 may not be what they need at 24 or 25. Our next slide shows some of the areas you could identify uh, where they might need supported decision making. 
Thanks. So this tool um, was created by the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, and it's similar to the transition readiness assessment. It's a form that you can just go through um, and explore whether the youth or young adult needs decision-making support um, in six different areas of life that are bulleted here. And the response options, um, so this is, it's a tool that the youth can fill out, but they can have um, assistance from their parent or caregivers, they can fill it out together. Um, but the response options are, I can decide with no extra support, I need support with my decision, or I need someone to decide for me. And then these are just a few examples that come from the healthy living um, domain. And so these are, it's just a way to kind of start a conversation about whether decision-making support is needed in these different areas of life. Okay, so the next question, what are some of the legal changes in healthcare that happen at age 18? So um, I wanna also, for any of you in Annie's last slide, when she's talking about charting the life course, run, don't walk to charting the life course. And I'll tell you why. Um, it's great for everybody. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, again, there's tools in there that can help any of your children um, in terms of identifying goals, that type of thing. But the other thing is you'll see some organizations um, that are out there. I know uh, the National Family Voices Conference, they did a whole training at this when we had our uh, conference there in Washington, D.C. Some, uh, there are sometimes online, um, you know, training and workshop opportunities that are free that go over this. If you have that opportunity, please, you know, uh, even your, it might even be your local parent training information center, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. But uh, there's also another website that goes hand in hand, um, another organization called just simply supported decision making.org. Again, lots of tools um, that can help you with this. So now we're going to talk, next slide, we're going to talk about what happens at 18. So regardless of the level of disability or medical complexity of your child, at 18 in the United States, they reach age majority. When we're looking at health care, um, all of their decision-making, their records, which again was in the video um, for, uh, you know, for the God transition, you know, overview of healthcare transition. You do not have to, again, seek guardianship. There are many, many options. There's medical power of attorneys. Um, there are proxies. Uh, a simple thing you can do, uh, again, and you can do it, you can prepare before they're 18, but I want you to know this, they cannot sign consent until they're 18. But your HIPAA, get the HIPAA form from your doctor. You know, make sure that, you know, you're going to continue to have access to the health portal. But your, you know, now adult child has to sign off on that. I think that um, the one thing about the myths on guardianship is that people do this as an act of love to protect their children. Unfortunately, in the United States, it's very easy to get guardianship on people with disabilities. I think the Britney Spears, um, you know, uh, situation sort of highlighted even with unlimited resources, how difficult it is to overturn. And I wanna go back to what I said, think about where somebody is at 18, where will they be at 21, 25, 30? Um, there are many, many supports that you can put in place. When you go through guardianship and have someone adjudicated as incompetent and needing a guardian, Remember, that's now the courts are going to be in their life forever. And I'm not suggesting that there are not times it's appropriate. That's something that you as a family have to make decisions. But make sure you're fully informed to all of the decisions because it's hard to undo. And I think that the other thing is, is that um, people think, well, I'm a guardian. I'll be appointed the guardian. And I have this huge family. And then their siblings will be the guardian. It's up to the court to decide who that guardian is, even if you have people in place who have agreed that when we're gone, because we're mortal, 
uh, that they will be the guardian. I want you guys to do everything you can to get fully informed. And again, um, even with your special education, if your child's in special education or just even general education at 18, they need to sign a letter authorizing you because now they're the decision maker of their education and special education records. So I think it's very, very important also for those of you who have males are 18, you still have to register for selective service. Um, that doesn't mean that if they reinstated a draft that it's likely your child would get, um, you know, drafted if they have complex medical needs or developmental or mental health needs, but you still have to do it. You're not exempt. Next. So <clears throat> this is just a one pager that's in the family toolkit um, that lays out some of the important legal changes that happen at age 18. So it just describes what happens in terms of changes in privacy, confidentiality, decision-making, and sharing medical information. Um, so that's just a screenshot of what it looks like. And I'm gonna keep moving on um, just because we're running short on time. So the next question is, what are the differences between pediatric and adult care? So in pediatrics, the expectation is that um, the parent's responsible for all components of the child's health care. But when you transition to adult practices, the expectation and legal obligation is that your adult child will be the decision maker. So again, you want to be proactive, um, you know, start building. You can't do this all at once. It's too much. Annie's going to highlight the tip sheet that we have on transition um, on gottransition.org in the next slide for very important considerations. Great, so we have a couple of tip sheets about the differences between pediatric and adult care. Um, this one is directed towards the youth and it just shows how their care will change once they move from pediatric to adult care. So they can look at all of the changes um, so they can see in the left-hand column what their pediatric care is like now and just see how it will change when they move to adult care. Um, and then they can just see if there's anything they have questions about or concerns about um, and bring it to their appointment to discuss these concerns with their doctor or discuss them with their uh, parent or caregiver. Um, so, and then on the back side, there are also some tips for preparing for the move to adult health care. Um, so again, this kind of has just some skills um, that they should um, ideally start to work on in adolescence um, just to begin to take more responsibility for their own health care. And then there's one more tip sheet. This is a one pager that again, just shares some differences between pediatric and adult healthcare. Um, and it's more um, about the system differences between the pediatric system and the adult healthcare system. So again, they can look through these differences and if they have any questions about them, um, bring it with them to an appointment and ask their doctor questions. So the next question is, how ready is my child to transition to adult care and manage their own health and health care? Well, again, we've already stated that, and I'm gonna be brief on this. It depends on your individual child's needs and medical complexities in terms of when they can manage it all on their own. If they have a lot of providers, and they have very complex needs and their illness impacts them in a place where um, they're not able um, you know, to communicate or they're hospitalized frequent, then obviously you're going to have to put in some of the supports we discussed. But in terms of identifying the readiness, again, we have lots of tools. Annie's going to talk a little bit more about them. Use those checklists to just, even, even if you have a good idea of where you think they're at, the checklist might highlight some areas of need that you didn't consider. So please check out these tools. Great, so this transition readiness assessment, so um, Darcy shared one earlier, this presentation that was for the youth, and we have a very similar version that is just directed towards the parent or caregiver. 
Um, so the version Darcy shared, it was directed at the youth so they could go through and see what skills they already have and what they want to learn, work on. Um, and then this one is just directed at the parent so they can fill it out to see what they think their child already knows. Um, and if they each, if the parent and youth each fill it out, they can compare, um, just compare their responses to see where they agree or disagree. And then they can kind of select some skills that they really want to work on um, with together and also with their provider. And then there is a version in the family toolkit that was customized um, by the American College of Physicians. It was customized for specifically for youth with intellectual or developmental disabilities. So there's a version for youth and one for the parent or caregiver. And then just one other way to see, kind of test how ready the youth is to transition. We have a quiz and this was created with our youth um, and young adult advisory group. So there's a version for youth as well as one for parents and caregivers that we then created with our family advisory group. Um, and it's just a shorter, um, kind of more fun, briefer online quiz to see how ready they are to transition. And then based on their responses to the questions, there are there's a set of resources that will show up at the very end of the quiz. Um, so there's the link to the parent version, but you can find the youth version on our website as well. And just to show you where you can find these resources, this is what our parents and caregivers page looks like. So if you go to gottransition.org, there's a tab for parents and caregivers. And this, it, if you scroll down on the page, it has our most popular resources. So it has the family toolkit, which is in English and in Spanish. Um, it has an infographic that links to some of our most popular resources. It has that video that we watched. Um, it also has a resource about how to, um, how to set up the medical ID feature on your health app, um, either on your iPhone or Android phone. Um, and then it has some of the individual tools that are included in the family toolkit. And it also has some frequently asked questions. And then here are just some links um, to some of the tools we've talked about and a couple others. So there's the family toolkit. Um, we also have an infographic that we recently created about transition during um, the as youth uh, begin college, ha what happens in terms of healthcare transition. And then there's the video, and there's also a couple of resources about telehealth and healthcare transition. Um, and with these telehealth appointments, um, the idea is that the pediatric and adult provider can both be present with the youth or young adults um, before the actual, before the initial adult visit. So they can um, just ask their current doctor and their new doc adult doctor any questions that they have about transition. And then this is a website that was just launched um, this month that was created um, for youth and young adults, specifically with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it has a lot of healthcare transition resources, both for the youth uh, their parents or caregivers, as well as their clinicians. Okay, so now I think I am going to turn it back to Deanna. Thank you so much, Annie, Erin. This was a fantastic talk and just incredible resources. And Darcy, thank you so much for sharing um, your journey, Nick's journey, and your experience as well. It's really um, amazing to have continued to learn from you over the last few years and to be able to highlight these challenges for the histiocytosis community, but also for um, the rare disease community broadly. And Got Transitions Family Toolkit is an amazing resource. Annie and Aaron, thank you. Your wealth of knowledge, and we really appreciate your time. 
Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We do have some time for questions, maybe just a couple minutes and a couple questions. Um, but I know uh, that um, there were a lot of questions that were submitted in advance. And also there are some questions and comments here that have been shared today. So the first question is about um, multidisciplinary team and a lot of specialists. Any tips on how to um, sort of coordinate those specialists when um, you need to help your child through a transition? Sometimes the specialists may not all be in the same institution, um, or they might not be working together as much as you'd like. How do you, and also, do you need all those specialists as an adult? How, any tips and tricks for how to sort of facilitate and coordinate that when you have multiple specialists? Do you guys want me to take it? So, so let me throw this out. One of the big barriers, again, is this is why you have to address healthcare transition, especially if your child's going to go to school, like in another state, something like that. Again, I go back to the insurance piece. This is one of the biggest barriers. Um, there are some places that, again, have specialty groups like CHOPS and DuPont um, that actually will keep youth up to like 26 because, th because they know of the need. The barrier is again, um, you know, planning as early as possible. Um, another thing that I think about, if your child is college bound, then you need to start looking around a couple of years in advance. And again, when you start visiting those colleges, start thinking about who else is there. But again, if you have a rare or, or um, you know, um, illness that's not something where they have a specialist you know, in every big city, then you need to rely on the team that you have to start making those connections. Thank you. Um, we'll see if any other questions come in. Uh, as you know, as people, there were some comments as well in the in the chat around um, just either losing access to those healthcare documents at an age younger than 18. Um, then also a comment that was brought up about the creation of a document listing significant um, medications, treatments, dates, and things like that for a child early on so that they can remember. I don't know um, if there's any uh, comments that you'd like to respond to in regards to that, but I know both that, that creating that with your child can be a great resource, but also losing access to um, records and things like that can create uh, a real challenge. Any tips for how to navigate that? So I can start and then Erin, if you wanna add, um, there is a tool that's part of these six core elements of healthcare transition that is the medical summary. Um, and it it's, about four pages, I think, and the um, provider can help fill it out. It has the important healthcare um, and medical information about the youth or young adult patient that they can then share with the adult provider. Um, and it includes information like medications, um, previous important procedures. Um, and so the idea is that it can include the most important information that the adult provider really needs to know um, so that it can be sent from the pediatric to adult provider before the initial visit. And Erin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so when I was going back to those national supports and technology just speeding, you know, going at the speed of light, we also have a lot of electronic medical summaries, which is really important, again, if your youth was suddenly in a situation where you weren't there, that they have that information, the one thing they always have with them is their phone. And so I would think about, again, making sure you have that. I want to go back. I'm going to use, um, just I'm in Jersey. We have Robert Wood Johnson. Their health portal, they use something called My Chart. My sons, because I saw in one of the, um, some of the comments in the chat, I, it was interesting because I had his medical, I helped him set it up. All of a sudden, one day I was out of it. I thought, what happened here, you know? And um, I went into the portal. I had him, we opened up the portal and there was an additional component on it now that allowed him to give permission and access to others. And so we filled that out. And again, I know that, you know, across the country, people utilize different types of health portals. Um, but you know, this is, it, it, it's something that's really important. Most of the portals will have some type of health line, um, you know, or helpline, reach out to them, 
you know, send them, you know, your medical power of attorneys, your proxy, your HIPAA consents, because, you know, we know some of our kids really need additional support. You can't be locked out of this. Thank you so much. Very, very helpful. Um, and I'll, I'll respond to uh, another part of the, the question about specialists and finding a replacement. And there were some other questions related to uh, just concern in finding a, a someone who's expert in histiocytosis or your particular diagnosis. And I would just um, you know, stress the importance of finding maybe an advocacy group with the Histiocytosis Association specifically for our community. We do have relationships with institutions and clinicians around the United States and around the world. Um, it, we have a physician finder on our website. A lot of other advocacy groups do as well. And um, also we can help you navigate that. So just reaching out and speaking with us about your concern um, we can try to help find someone more local to you. Um, and also sometimes if you can find a, a physician who is willing to learn with you, that can be a very important resource because if they're willing to consult experts who may not be in the state, but are very likely willing to help raise awareness and spread that information that they have, um, then you can work with your local resources and still get the guidance from an expert. And so I would just encourage you to also lean in and feel comfortable asking for help. There are a lot of um, organizations like the association that are really um, eager to help. Want to add one other thing that's important. We talk about healthcare transition. And again, um, there are now some billing options, I believe, for consultation and for transition. And, you know, because now we do so much telehealth, there is a way when you transition and hand off to have an initial appointment before your pediatric specialist say bye bye, you know. And I think that that's something, and especially if you're looking at, um, you know, moving to a different state or having your child in um, another state going to college. And so I just want to throw that out there. And we do have telehealth resources on God Transition as well. No, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we could have a, a long conversation past this too on just all the different questions and complexities that come into the transition. Um, but thank you so much, Annie and Erin, for your time today. Um, and thank you, Darcy, for, for us sharing your experience and um, Nick Nick's wise words uh, you know, about how to take this on um, as he navigates the transition as well. And I just encourage anyone who has um, additional questions or hasn't yet gone to gottransition.org to check out their resources there. And um, we hope that this is going to be uh, the uh, start of many conversations like this. And the association is also looking to um, use some of the resources that gottransition.org has to customize them a little bit for the histiocytosis community. So I um, just wanna say thank you to everyone here today for um, sharing everything that you know and everything that you've learned, and also just for helping us continue to make this a priority for our community. So we appreciate you and wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to us at info at histio.org. We'll be sharing the recording. And if you have any questions for Annie, Erin, or Darcy, we can pass those along as well. So thank you all so much. I appreciate you. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to doing this more often.